all over to hear Jesus teach and preach about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, a massive crowd gathered outside the synagogue to hear him speak. Like any crowd, they were coming from many different places and many different perspectives. Young and old, men and women, rich and poor. But every person in that crowd had this one thing in common. They were tired. Tired of life. Tired of religion. Tired of waiting. And so he looked out upon this multitude of people who were scared, confused, and tired. And he told them, come to me. And that offer still stands for every one of us. Come to Jesus. All who are tired, all who are hurting, all who feel unworthy, all who feel unloved, all who have nothing left to give, come to Jesus. Bring your burdens, bring your fears, bring your biggest regrets and your worst mistakes. Bring your broken dreams and your painful disappointments. Bring your chains and bring your addictions. Bring it all and come to Jesus. Because he will receive you and he will redeem you. He will love you and he will lead you. He will accept you and forgive you. He will guide you and comfort you. He will care for you and watch over you. He will transform you and sustain you. So all who are weary, all who are lost, all who are tired, come as you are. Come today. Come to Jesus. Father God, we call upon you in Jesus' name, Yeshua's name. Lord God, we come to you. We have learned, Lord God, that we are merely instruments in your hand. And I'm just an instrument too, I'm just the axe, but you're the logger. And so I pray, Father God, that you use me to speak your word into the people's hearts. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you soften the hearts of those who hear it. So that we may understand at a greater depth what it means to draw near to you. Because in drawing near to you, we can find the rest for our weary souls. And they are weary. We get tired of fears, frustrations. We get tired of lack. We get tired of health issues. We get tired of seeing the news yet again of some other scandal. We long for the days when Yeshua will return and become the absolute utter king of this planet. And there will be no more dissent. But until that day, we are tired and we need your strength. Help us to step into it. In Yeshua's name we pray it. Amen. You know, when we talk about God's word, the Bible, what is the point? It's not just going through chapter by chapter and verse by verse just to understand a history lesson. There's more to it than that. And if I, as a pastor, am simply taking the story of history and I'm trying to read something into it, well, that's not good either. What, what we're looking for, specifically, are the biblical principles that God has inspired into this text. What's a principle? Well, a principle is a concept that transcends, that means it goes beyond. Uh, a, a, a concept that you can see in the Old Testament, in the New Testament. Something that transcends throughout the whole thing and you can go, oh, that concept is true about God. That concept is true about how God wants us to see something. Now, once you identify a principle, that's not enough. 
Just identifying it does you no good. What you have to do when a concept is identified, a principle is clearly laid out or illustrated, is you have to go, I am going to internalize that in my own personal thought process. You see, every single one of us in this room, whether we have considered it intellectually or not, we all have a worldview. Now, what a worldview is, everybody has one. It doesn't matter if you're this tall or this tall. It doesn't matter what country you come from or language you speak. Everybody has a worldview. And what a worldview is, is a connected set of beliefs that you have in your head and heart. These are connected. A plus B equals C. You have internalized these beliefs, these connected set of beliefs about how the world should be, about what reality is, about what is good, about what is bad. We all internalize this, and it is our personal worldview, and it colors how we interact with other people. Because as we're in, interacting with somebody and, and they say something and it triggers us emotionally, there's a reason that it triggered us emotionally. I mean, Trish might say something to me, triggers me. She says the same thing to Carly and it doesn't trigger Carly. Why? Because we have a different set of connected beliefs about what is good, what is bad, what is true, what is right, what is rude, what is not. Trish, not that you're rude, I just, you know, you're in the front row, it's one of those things. Okay, but you understand what I'm saying, is that a connected set of beliefs. Now, what God wants from us as we study what he has revealed through his word, is that we alter our worldview. We change that set of connected beliefs so that it matches biblical principles. We, we, we gain a biblical worldview. Now, not everybody has this. Now, even people who think they have a biblical worldview tend not to. Now, I'll explain this. You know, more than 60% of people polled in the United States still claim to be Christians. Over 90% still claim they believe in God. But you've, you've, you've got that huge percentage, majority. But when you focus down your questions, and you get 50 questions and answers, and you do all your polls, you will find that of that 60% who say they are Christians, only 4% actually have a biblical worldview. They're actually Christians. Their biblical, their views match the Bible. Now, I said it colors how you deal with things. That's like wearing glasses. If these glasses are tinted green, everything is going to appear green to me. Okay, so if somebody comes up and they say it's black, but all I can see is green, I'm going to be in conflict with that person immediately because my worldview says, no, it's green because it's colored. Now, everybody has a, Bible, or has a, uh, a worldview. What we want to do is we want to, to, to create a biblical worldview in our hearts so that when we see things, we see them as God wants us to see them. Okay, so it's not enough. I'm going to identify at least four major biblical principles in this passage. What you need to do is take those things away from here and meditate, mull on, think about those things and go, how can I internalize that until it becomes a part of my thought process? It becomes my worldview. That's what you need to do. Now, because Just because you hear something once does not mean you've internalized it and made it part of your worldview. Isn't that correct? It usually takes multiple times of hammering up against something. I mean, if you eat enough cream puffs, you will recognize that it has an effect. Okay? And when you realize it has an effect, that changes your worldview. I should not eat so many cream puffs. Okay? You know, but you, you, you tend to give yourself permission to eat them. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Until you really realize, and your worldview changes. Because you went, okay, now I see the connection between these things. 
So what I'm asking you to do as we go through this, and not just this message, but any message that we preach, my responsibility as the pastor is to look at this and go, what are the biblical principles here that this illustrates? How do I prove that that's a biblical principle, not just something that I'm thinking? And how do I express it and explain it to them so that they can internalize it and change their point of view? By changing your point of view, that's going to give you strength and it's going to give you power from within. Now, I'm going to explain why here in a moment. But let's take a look at Isaiah chapter 10. We're going to finish off the chapter today. And to kind of, you know, sum up where we were, take a look at verse 12. It says, it will be that when the Lord has completed all his work on Mount Zion and on Jerusalem, that he's going to say, I will punish the fruit of the arrogant heart of the king of Assyria and the arrogant pride of his eyes. For he has said, by the power of my hand and my wisdom, I did this. All right, so the context of chapter 10, as we, if you may recall, is that the corruption of the government in northern Israel and in southern Judah, in those two countries, their corruption, both politically and religiously, had gotten over the top. And they had ended up in this situation, which I'm sure you cannot relate to. See, the, the, the thing is, is that sometimes people say, why are we studying this book that is a prophecy from 800 years, 730 years before Jesus was born? Why don't we talk about things that are closer to home? Well, I, you know, we're going to go through a chapter and verse. So I'm sure that this doesn't make any sense to you. Because the situation was, there was an elite class that was using statutes in order to make themselves rich off the backs of the middle class and the poor. And you have no idea what that's like. <laughs> I know you can't relate. I'm so sorry. Or maybe you can. How many of you think you could relate to what was going on in the 8th century? Yeah. It's Fox News tonight. I mean, it's exactly what's going on. Nothing has changed. Human beings are the same. It, it, it is the same situation. And so there are principles that he is talking about then that we can apply right now in our hearts to help us deal with the elites in our culture who are using unjust statutes in order to make themselves rich off of our backs. And we need to know how to deal with that from a godly point of view. Now, one thing that you need to recognize, and I've been saying this over and over and over again, judgment is coming to the United States of America. It is coming. And I, I've been warning that, and I'm not popular to say that, neither was he, okay? And he was saying, look, the Assyrians are coming. And that, now, that was, that was direct, and it was specific, the Assyrians. Now, you've got to understand that in that time period, that was scandalous to say. Because the Assyrians were this massive empire. I mean, they were gigantic. Had existed for over 700 years. And they had ruled the ancient Near East, not because of their great policies, but because of their incredible cruelty. They were absolutely brutal. And so the thought, here's, here's the prophet saying that judgment's going to come, very much like this pastor has said, judgment is coming. But the, 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 the prophet went so far as to say, and Assyria is going to bring that. And everybody who was a believer was scandalized by this. I mean, real believers. Not, not just the fake ones. Not, not just the politicians. But real believers were going, how could God allow this bloodthirsty, cruel, evil empire to be used by him? God is too good and too awesome and too, too pure to use something so disgusting and yucky in, in the lives of his believers. And it was a scandal. And this is why the prophet is explaining, God is explaining through the prophet what, what is going on. And this is the principle that you and I need to understand. God may use what appears to you to be an ungodly influence in your life, but he may allow it to correct you or to guide you. He may allow that. That is a principle. So th that's something you need to get into your head. But here's the second half of that principle, and this I really want you to get to understand, is that while he may allow that in order to cause a correction in your life, 
He will always make things right. The people who he allows to function in your life as a means of correction or guidance, if they cross the line, they will be held responsible for what they have done and said. And this is something that you need to internalize emotionally because you live in a fallen, broken world. And sometimes God will allow things to happen in your life and it will be unfair. You could write a, the book titled, What is Unfair? And you are, it's a nonfiction book. It's your life. Okay, that, that, that can happen. And you have to internalize the principle that while that may happen, the principle is God will not let them get away with it. Evil will always be dealt with. For example, how many of you have had the joy in your life of getting fired? You, you've experienced this. Now, not very many people are willing to admit it, so let me try again. How many of you have been fired? How many of you should have been? Okay, now, here's the thing. I've had this happen to me. Yes, to me. And I remember the indignity of it. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, but, uh, but I remember this one time. I got fired twice, so I just, this one time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, but anyway, I got fired, and I knew I deserved it. How many of you know what I'm talking about? I'm like, <laughs> I mean, it, it, it was true. I really did drop the ball. I really did deserve to get let go. It's a fact. But the boss who was, who was doing the firing was basically right about the level of pond scum in terms of, you know, higher orders of li living things. You know what I mean? I mean, really, this person was like Assyria. They were a vile piece of work. I mean, I knew what their life was like, and I knew who they were, but that was the person in authority that was firing me. Now, I deserve to be fired, but my thought, even in the moment, was, and you're doing it? You know what I mean? But not only that, this person went over the top. Because there's a difference between, can, you, can I see you in my office, please? And letting me go and dragging me out in front of everybody to insult me and tear me down in front of everybody else. There's a big difference between that. That is wrong. That's flat unfair. Now, I deserve to be fired. I'm not, I'm not hiding from that. But the way this person treated me, it was just like this. It was, and I felt the same. I remember driving away from that, going, well, you didn't have to do that. You didn't have to say that. You didn't, and it hurt. Now, there's a biblical principle here that I needed then. I wish I'd had it then. To, because you get bitter, don't you? You get angry, and then you even question God. You go, God, why did you allow that? Why the Assyrians? Why him? I mean, you know, that, that's a little over the top. But if I had recognized that God does allow those things sometimes, and he assures me, right here in verse 12, he assures me, I will deal with them, trust me. This is the reason that God says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, not yours. I will take care of repayment. That's what God is saying. And it's a principle you and I need to do because you see, we hold on to bitterness when somebody does something like that in our life, don't we? And it becomes a burden to us. That's called unforgiveness. Now, people don't understand what forgiveness means because they, they, they hear Christians say, well, I forgive or I should forgive. And they think it means, okay, I'm letting you off for, for what you did. That's not forgiveness. I'm going to say now, well, it's no big deal that you, you know, assaulted me. No, that's, that's not it. That's not forgiveness. What forgiveness is, is it's a heart decision. Listen carefully now. It's a heart decision where you're going to let go of the debt another person has your direction. That person did hurt you. They owe you. That's a fact. But you're not going to get it out of them. And you decide, I'm going to quit trying. I'm going to quit holding on to my right to be angry. My right. I'm going to turn that over to a higher authority, him. I'm going to say, yes, you insulted me. Yes, you hurt me. But I am not going to hold that against you now. You have to deal with my dad. Have a nice day. <laughs> Do you see where we're going with this? 
I'm putting my trust that he's going to make things right. I'm no longer going to let it keep me up at night. This is not fair. I can't believe he gets away with that. No, no, no. He ain't going to get away with it. My God knows every heart. He knows everything. There are no secrets with him. He will make it right. That's the principle we need to get. And he will make it right in a hard way. Take a look. Therefore, the Lord, the God of armies, will send a wasting disease. They're not going to get away with this, guys. A wasting disease among Assyria's stout warriors. And under his glory, a fire will be kindled like a burning flame. It's going to be bad when I deal with them, guys. And the light of Israel will become a fire and Israel's holy one a flame. And it will burn and devour his thorns and his briars in a single day. So, the principle is that sometimes God allows, you know, these things to come into your life, but he will make things right. And when he does, the person who is being dealt with is going to wish they had repented. Right? And that's why we need to pray for those who despitefully use us. Be forgiving, because it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And you are his servant. You belong to him. And they said, what about you? To you? They treated you how? Do you think God doesn't care? You are mistaken. He does. And he will deal with it. And if you hold on to that, emotionally speaking, you can go, you know, they're, they're going along, thinking they got away with it. But I know what's coming. And it's going to look like Assyria. And boy, I feel sorry for you now. You don't have to be bitter. You don't have to be angry. You don't have to hold on to the burden. You can go, I've released it to the higher authority, and I wouldn't want to, be a, I wouldn't want to cross him. So I'm not going to lose any sleep over it anymore. That's what forgiveness is. Now, there is a second part of this principle that we need to understand. God will sometimes allow correction to come into your life. He will allow judgment if you need it. But sometimes that correction or that judgment is on someone who is near you. It's not on you, but it affects you. Now, that is a biblical principle. We talked about it last week. We called it the Shamu effect. If, if, you're, if you're in the front row, Shamu's going to come up and splash down. The water's going to get you wet. It does not matter who you are, whether you deserve it or not. If you're in the splash zone, you're getting splashed. It is the same here. This principle, you're about to see it in the rest of chapter 10. Take a look, verse 18. And he, God, will destroy the glory of his, talking about a serious forest, and of his fruitful garden, both soul and body, and it will come, to, uh, and it will be as when a sick person wastes away, and the rest of the trees of his forest will be so small in number that a child could write them down. In other words, this devastation is going to be so huge against Assyria that a kid could go, they've got this many left. Now, how many of you know that if you hammer the, the ancient Near East's largest empire that hard in one day, it's going to change the stock market, the economy, everything. That's the Shamu effect. And that happens in our lives. In your family, you didn't do it, but your cousin did, and it causes the problem in the whole family. Everybody's upset. Everybody gets hurt. You understand what I'm saying? And when that happens, again, that biblical principle, you need to grasp it and internalize it. Because you want to be bitter at your cousin. You want to, you know, you know uh, come unglued. But you have to go, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. God will not let evil go unpunished. And even if I didn't directly deserve it, he will deal with it. And to fall into the hands of the living God is a terrifying thing. Take a look, 2 Kings 19.35. Then it happened that night, this is talking about the Assyrian army, that the angel of the Lord went out and struck 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. And when the rest got up early in the morning, behold, all of the 185,000 were dead. I mean, it is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Repent. Or face that. That's what God is saying. And that's why he's saying to you, be compassionate even on your enemies. Be compassionate on them. Pray for them. 
Pray that they repent. They don't want to fall into the wrath of me because I am eternal. My wrath against sin and against rebellion is like water coming over a waterfall. It never changes and it's always the same. As I dealt with Assyria, as I dealt with Sodom and Gomorrah, so I will deal with those who hate me in this generation. Pray for them. I saved you and you didn't deserve it. Pray for them. Are you with me? You see, that's a different way of thinking, isn't it? It's a different set of beliefs about how things should be. It's a different worldview. Now he's going to talk to the remnant. Take a look at verse 20. Because when you go through something like this, the Assyrians being destroyed, all this happening, it, there's a remnant of people. And something happens to the remnant. Now remember we said that you and I are in that remnant because we're in that 4%. Remember 60% say they're Christians, but only 4% really are. We're in that group. They were trying to build a real biblical worldview and live by it. Okay, so we're in that group. We're in that remnant. But as we go, so there's a reason God will allow correction, God will allow judgment, and sometimes God will allow the Shamu effect. But all three of those things are going to expose something in the remnant. Take a look. It exposes. Now on that day, the remnant of Israel and those of the house of Jacob who have escaped. So, that, so that, that's representative of believers, true believers. That would be you will no longer rely on the one who struck them. That's Assyria. Why were they relying on Assyria? Now let's think about it for a second. If you go into the story, you know that in Judah, not everybody was an unbeliever. There were plenty of real believers listening to Isaiah the prophet, right? They knew that their king, Ahab, was trying to, had made a secret deal. It became non-secret, you know, after it was exposed. He'd paid a huge bribe to the Assyrians. Go ahead, tackle Israel, leave us alone. And the Assyrians happily took the bribe. So who was everybody in town relying on? The Assyrians to keep their word. Even the remnant were. In other words, we as a remnant tend to rely on the system around us. Don't we? However much I love the United States, however much I love the Constitution, that ain't God's word. And we rely on America. We rely on the Constitution. We rely on, you know, still believing that our judges can't be bought. <laughs> Hunter. But anyway, you know, we, we still believe that. And yet it strikes us, doesn't it? You will no longer rely on the one who struck you. They're arresting our, our people in the streets for praying. Okay? You will no longer rely on the one who struck you, but you will truly rely. You will truly rely on the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. You'll find out as the remnant. You'll go, oh yeah, I should have been relying totally on you, not on the system around me. The remnant will return, the remnant of Jacob, to the mighty God. So you see, so many of us, we are the remnant. We really believe, we really want a biblical worldview. We just don't realize how much we're relying on the system around us. We don't realize how much we're doing that. I, you know, when I was a public school educator, I did not realize how much I was relying on a non-biblical um, educational philosophy for the teaching that I was doing. I had no idea I was doing it until it got exposed. You see, oftentimes, we talked about this, why does God allow judgment? It, it's not punishment. It's confrontation. It exposes. See, God will not overcome your free will. Those things expose it in your life, and you can go, oh, I can make a decision. Biblical worldview response, non-biblical worldview response. Those are my decisions. That's what it does. And it was doing it for them too. This was exposed. So what you and I need to learn to do, listen, is we, we find these biblical principles. We need to internalize them. We internalize them. That's an act of faith. Now what's that? Now faith, trust is another word we would use. Okay, but what, what does that mean? The word in Greek is pistis and it it, it's much deeper than just intellectually saying you believe something. 
See, you can say you believe something, but when, when you know, bad things happen, when it hits the fan, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Some of you are going, I can't believe he said that. I'm human. Okay, now, here, here's the thing. It happens, doesn't it? It happens. And when it does, that exposes us. Because in that moment, so many people who say they are Christians and say they believe, when bad things happen, they just abandon everything they said they believed and run, bo- run back into worldly li- way of living. That exposes that in their heart, they were never truly relying on him. Whereas here, when they were going through it, it exposed the fact that they really do rely on him. They will no longer rely on the one who struck them. Does that make sense? So how do we get there? How do we get to be the people who have that biblical worldview and own it and internalize it and we are the remnant? Well, we have to make choices of faith. And faith is a decision of the heart, a decision you make constantly. I should have said it's a decision of the heart you are constantly making not to resist or oppose God's direction in your life. God's revelation in your life. You're not going to resist that. Why? Because you've decided you're going to rely on him and what he says. So when the situation comes up in you and every emotion in you says, I want to blow up, grab things, throw them across the room, screaming and hollering, every kind of foul language known to human beings, that is your feeling. It's your temptation. But when the situation comes up in your heart, you have internalized, wait a minute. The Bible says that outbursts of wrath is a work of flesh. The Bible says that, you know, the wrath of man does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. And you, you, those scriptures start going through your head and you go, in this moment, I'm going to call out to God from my heart, Lord God, give me the strength not to blow up because that is a work of the flesh. I need you right now. Shotgun prayer. And when you make that choice of faith, the Holy Spirit goes, ah, that's what I was looking for because I will not overcome your free will. You could freely choose to blow your top right now, but you called out to me. I will empower that choice. And every time you do that, you build a new habit until eventually outbursts of wrath become a thing of your past. Now, why does God do it that way? I don't like it any more than you. I wish God would just go, zap, you're fixed. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Uh, He just doesn't do it that way. What I've learned about God is that he just does not steer parked cars. He doesn't. You've got to make the move because your free will must be activated. Remember, that's the image of God. and He won't violate it. You have to activate. I will act in faith. And as soon as you do, he goes, I'll steer. I got it. He empowers. And that's where the transformation process of the Holy Spirit begins in your life as a Christian. And you do this over and over and over and over and over again. And hey, God begins to transform you. You change. Your worldview changes. It's great. But that's hard, isn't it? Especially when you're really mad. Or or whatever your temptation happens to be. This choice is not an easy one to make, friends. If it was easy, everybody would do it. But it's not. And only the remnant will make this choice. And it will be a small group. Jesus said so, Matthew 7. You can enter God's kingdom, all right. You can do it, but only through the narrow gate. It's not easy. The highway to hell, that's easy. That's broad. Its gate is wide for the many who choose that way. But the gateway to life, it's very narrow. The road is what? Difficult. How hard is that to restrain yourself when when your temper wants to go for it? And you are telling yourself, choose the world biblical worldview that's difficult i mean that's a heavy burden you have to literally resist yourself but did not jesus say you want to come and follow me deny yourself resist yourself and take up the what 
cross. It's a burden. It's heavy. It's not easy. Then come follow me. Only a remnant will because it's difficult. Few there are that find it. Now, I know that doesn't preach very well because everybody wants, you know, easy things. I'm not going to preach anything to you other than God's truth, okay? It won't always be easy to hear. In fact, most of the time, it's going to be the hardest thing you ever heard. Only God can do this in your life. You have to rely on Him. You can't do this on your own. It's simply not possible. But with Him, all things possible. You put your, I'm going to rely on Him. I can't do this. I can't go through that near. I can't, it's too hard. You're right. But if you rely on Him and you pour your heart out to Him, He will transform you from within and you'll find yourself walking that road. So, Verse 22, for though your people Israel may be like the sand of the sea, only a remnant within them will return. So, hey, there's lots of people that claim to be children of God. There were lots in Israel, but only a remnant will actually return. A destruction is determined. Hey, bad stuff is going to happen and I'm going to allow it is what God is saying. But it overflows with righteousness. In other words, God's reason for allowing Correction, judgment, or the Shamu effect. They are right. God does not make mistakes. He allows those things, even a complete destruction that is determined. The God of armies, he will execute it in the midst of the whole land. He is allowing this. That's the principle. I will trust you. Job said it. Though you slay me, yet will I trust you. I mean, that's how far he went in his thought. So this faith is a choice of the heart to believe that God's judgment, God's correction, or the Shamu effect are things that he allows, but he overflows with righteousness. So he's got a plan and he's got a reason and I will trust him. I will rely on him. Now, he says, if that's the choice that you are making, therefore, verse 24, this is what the Lord God of armies says. Because you're going to be the remnant, you're trusting me. My people who dwell in Zion, do not fear the Assyrian who strikes you with the rod and lifts up the staff against you the way Egypt did. Look, these things are going to happen. Judgment correction, the Shamu effect. Don't be afraid of it when it does. You're the remnant. Don't fear it when the stock market crashes. Don't fear the next election or lack thereof. Do not (laughs) fear the judges that can be bought. Do not. That's the principle here. Because in a very little while, my indignation against you will be ended and my anger will be directed toward their destruction. Sodom and Gomorrah went a long ways before God destroyed it, but when he did, it was utter and it was vast. And he says, as it was in the days of Sodom, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. He's coming back and it'll be like those days. Very little while. The Lord of armies will wield a whip against him like the defeat of Midian at the rock of Oreb. You can read about that in the book of Judges chapter 12. And his staff will be over the sea. And he will lift it up the way he did in Egypt. So it will be on that day that his burden will be removed from your shoulders. And his yoke from your neck. And the yoke will be broken because of Now, how many of you know that here in the 21st century, we don't like the idea of fatness. We fight it. But you see, in those days, when you're eating 800 to 1,000 calories a day, fatness was a good thing. Okay? Now, it's important for us to understand the principle that we're seeing here. Okay. Correction, judgment, shamu effect. You're the remnant. You begin to internalize, I trust God, I'm going to rely on him through this situation. Okay. You're good to go. Here's the promise. I will break the yoke of suffering that you have endured. I will. I will take it away. You won't even remember the worst of times on this planet. On all the fatness and the goodness that I'm going to give you. It's going to be over the top. That's the principle you need to hold on to. But there's something a little deeper here. It says, I'll break this yoke because of fatness. Now, what does he mean by that? 
Well, the word fatness in Hebrew is shemen. And it, it refers to fat, but also oil or olive oil for anointing. So whenever, and throughout the Old Testament you will see this, even in the New, whenever you see oil or fat used in a symbolic or illustrative way, it always refers to the Holy Spirit. So what he's saying is the reason I'm going to pour this blessing out on you is not because you kept rules better than other guys. Not because you went to the temple more than other people did. But because the Holy Spirit is in you. And that carries on into this. See, in, in the New Testament, we put our trust in Jesus. You died on the cross to pay for my sins. I believe it. I cling to that. I hold that. I'm not depending on my righteousness. I'm depending on yours. And the moment you repent from a lifestyle that's all about yourself to I am now dedicated and loyal to you and I trust you to wash my sins away. The moment you did that, the Bible says that God put the Holy Spirit in you. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit of God. The fatness is in you. And because of that, he will break the yoke of suffering. He will break the burden of this nasty life you've had to endure. And the day is going to come when you're over at my house eating s'mores in heaven where we do not have to worry about s'mores. We will be having a ball talking about our boss. And you'll hand me a s'more and go, didn't we live somewhere once? And I'm going to go, oh, isn't God great? Isn't this awesome? He will break it. So when you're going through the worst of times, you call out to him, you draw near to him, and you say, I believe what you said. You will break this yoke. The day is coming. I rely on you that that is true. Even when I feel like this. When you make that choice, the Holy Spirit will empower you from within to get through the worst of things. See, when you draw near to him, he draws near to you. Zechariah chapter 1, verse 3, this is what the Lord of armies says, return to me, declares the Lord of armies, that I may return to you. That I may? You see, God will not violate your free will. You must draw near to him before he will draw near to you. It's not that he can't, it's that he won't. He won't violate your free will. You want assurance from God? You want the love of God to flow through your heart? Then draw near to Him. Bear your soul to Him. Especially when it comes bearing down on you like a freight train, and life can do that. Look what happened to them. Verse 28. He, Assyria, has come against Ayath. He has passed through Migron. At Michmash, he has deposited his baggages. These are... These are towns in the north and it's, it's moving from north to south the enemy is coming the enemy is coming they've gone through the pass saying Geba will be our encampment for the night I mean they're, they're camping in Rama is terrified and Gibeah of Saul has fled cry aloud with your voice daughter of Galim pay attention Lysha and wretched Anathoth Mad, uh, uh, Madmanah has fled the inhabitants of Gebem have sought refuge yet today he will halt at Nob. He's shaking his fist at the mountain of the daughter of Zion on the hill of Jerusalem. Nob is the, uh, uh, the Mount of Olives. Okay, the Assyrian army came all the way down through all of these towns. They saw them coming. They got all the way to the gates of Jerusalem. They're on the hill. They're shaking their fist within sight of the city. And you and I, as the remnant, we look at that and we go, my bills are crowding in. My problems are crowding in. They're getting closer and closer. They're shaking their fist at me. I don't know what I'm going to do. And God is saying, look, I see them coming too. I see them coming too. But behold, the Lord God of armies will lop off the branches with terrifying power. In that moment, that's when God's going to come through. That's when he's going to come through. Now, I know we don't like that. We hate the whole last minute thing. God, why didn't you solve this five years ago? Why are you giving me an opportunity for a job now when I'm thinking about bankruptcy? I mean, why does God do that? 
Those also who are tall and structural will be cut down, and those who are lofty will be brought low. He will cut down the thickets of the forest with an iron axe, and Lebanon will fall by the mighty one. Why does God wait to the last minute to solve a problem in the lives of his remnant, of you and me? Why does he do that? Because, guys, and I don't like this any more than you, but a salvation you cannot see. While it's very real, you're not going to appreciate it very much because you can't see it. And that's why God so often allows judgment, correction, or the Shamu effect in our life. It, it exposes our free will. Will we truly rely on Him? When we choose to rely on Him, yet everything crowds in on us like the Assyrians coming from the north. And all of a sudden we're going, God, are you going to come through? And He does that very night. But we go, why did you do that? Because a salvation you can't see is not exalted in your eyes. It's kind of like this. How many of you are old enough to have one of these on your arm? How many of you got one of those? Those of you that are young are going, I don't get it. Okay, well, we were assaulted as children <laughs> by a shot that they put in our arms to inoculate us against smallpox. Now, I never got smallpox. I never knew anybody who did. Because they eradicated that virus from the planet. Now, I never gave it much thought. It didn't. I never thought much to say thank you to the doctor who stabbed me. None of those things. Because it was a salvation, all right. But I didn't see it. So it didn't make much difference to me. But the day I had a massive heart attack, and my friend Doug saved my life, and Dr. Kaplan saved my life, and Del Webb came through for me, they were highly exalted in my eyes. And my wife and my friends coming to support me and love on me, they were highly exalted in my eyes. You see, God will wait because you are the remnant so that you will exalt Him. And when you exalt Him, that's a means of drawing near to him. And when you draw near to him, he will draw near to you. He will draw near to you. And that's the key to what we're talking about today. Whatever circumstance that you face in this life, when you decide, I'm gonna, this is my biblical worldview, I will draw near to him. No matter what I feel, I'm, I'm going to pour out my heart and my soul to him. I'm going to cry out to him. Then he is exalted by you. And in that, he will deliver you. And that's what we're going to do right now. You see, what we, we want you to learn, a biblical worldview. We don't just sing songs, friend. These are catalysts. They are designed to help you draw near you look at those words and you go, those are my words. I'm choosing to make those words real from my heart to his. I'm going to draw near to him. I'm going to mean what this is saying. And when you do that, you draw near. When you raise your hands, you humble yourself. You're not worried about this person or that person. or that. You don't care. You are reaching up to him. You're going, I will draw near. When you do this, he draws near to you. And when he draws near to you, you are empowered from within like never before. And that's what we're going to do right now. Stand up with me. Let's draw near to our king. Let's pour out our hearts. Let's get vulnerable before him. Because he is worthy of every ounce of our praise. Behold the Lamb upon the cross who takes away the sins of all. Forgiveness flows from hands and feet 
as violence meets the Prince of Peace. Behold the King. taking it right back up again. There is no body in that grave. You are the king and we will exalt you. We will celebrate you. And by doing that, we draw near. And now, Father God, I pray if there's anybody in this room they're facing correction or judgment or even the Shamu effect, I pray, Father God, that you minister to them in their heart. Draw them up to the front that our prayer team may pray over them and minister with them. 
Show us, Lord God, why relying on you is a really good plan. We pray, Lord God, you help us to internalize these truths so that our worldview shifts and changes and we are able to handle no matter what happens until you come and get us. But in the meantime, we will exalt you. We will celebrate you. We will sing. We will dance. We will shout. We will make a joyful noise because you are worthy. And we pray these things in Yeshua's name. Amen. See you next time.